How to build a prog rock website on your own terms. I'm John Bowden from Aircom Radio Network. Our sister site, Rock History Music, here on YouTube has used a lot of Eamon O'Neill stories from Eon Music. Eamon has turned into a really good friend of ours, and I wanted to know his story. We borrowed so many of his. I wanted to know where he came from, how he eventually built Eon Music, which is incredibly successful online, talking about, as I mentioned, Rock, prog and rock and everything in between. He was recently backstage at the Progressive Music Awards and he really belonged there. But there's a long road from him doing that to going way back to finding his very first album, which he will hold in front of the camera for you. Check out our interview with our good friend, Eamon O'Neill of Eon Music. When did you get the bug? When did music start for you? Um, I can tell you that it's always been there. My father was a musician. Um, he's passed away now, but he was a mandolin player, and he played out traditional music. And he was always putting a mandolin into my hand and trying to get me to play it. I had no interest whatsoever. And then my older cousin had a copy of High Voltage by ACDC. And as soon as he pressed play, and I was seven years old, I went, wow. When I was seven, um... Sergeant Peppers came out. I lived in Montreal. And someone played it for me, and I remember going, yeah, it's kind of cool. But I didn't, I wasn't sophisticated enough. And I love hearing stories, and I've heard them a lot from people who are pre-10, that somehow it, it clicks into the brain. They go, you immediately like it. So you were like that. Let me show you one thing. Stay there. i got to sure. show you something. So, I was seven years old, and... That I, I still I had no dexterity on an instrument or whatever, but the music just hit me, and I was I'm I'm Catholic and I was making my first Holy Communion, and my aunt said to me, "What do you want as a present?" And I said, "I want an ACDC album," and this is it. You still have it? This is the cassette. This that's the actual cassette. That is not bought off eBay. That is that's the actual box. That's not a replacement box. That I got that in 1985 when it was released, and I was eight years old. I love that. And that started everything. One of the questions I would ask all artists, I'm always surprised by artists that, and maybe it's 25% in my history, that say, I have no idea what's the first album I ever I, I took everything in. I would listen to the radio, and I would hear songs, and I would go, right, who was the singer on that, and what else did he sing on? and who was the producer, and what's the name of the album. Yeah. And I would listen to the top 40 singles. But, I mean, that was 1985, and I say I was 8 years old. By the time I got to being 11 years old, um, would have been 1989, um, no, 1988. That was a very defining year for me, 1988, because the three biggest rock bands in the world were ACDC, Def Leppard, and Iron Maiden. And... It was an explosion for me. I got Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. I got Def Leppard's Hysteria, which was massive that yeah. year. Um, and actually, I'll tell you kind of a, a very, what's what's the word? A serendipitous fact about that. My three favorite bands, I've seen them all, are my three early bands, those three, ACDC, Iron Maiden, and Leopard. Everything sprung from that. But I've seen them all play in Hammersmith Odeon over the years. So <laughs> that's a personal pride. But once I started getting to 11, 12, 13, I mean, I remember sitting at primary school and a guy giving me a tape on one side of it, it had uh, Raining Blood and the other side had um, Peace Cells. Mm -hmm. So now you're going into thrash and then Guns N' Roses arrive in 1988. Um, and it's just... It's a perfect it, it was, storm for you. That, that, that was awesome. Totally. And uh, I mean, I, I can honestly tell you the way I feel today as uh, in my late 30s, I'm still that child sitting on the side of the grass listening to Appetite for Destruction. Nothing has changed. My interests haven't changed. The only difference is I've got older, I've learned a bit more, and I actually learned how to play guitar, which kind of blew my mind. <laughs> well, by you the know? way, when did that start for you? When did you learn to play guitar? Your, your playing is amazing. Well, thank you. No, the guitar playing started, it all started going back again to my father. He was very encouraging. And, but it wasn't until I got into this stuff here that I started picking up instruments that were lying around the house. I remember picking up a guitar. I didn't even know how to tune it. And I just started 
hitting a string and I started playing the bass line to Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the part in the middle of it. Do, 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 do. Wasn't in tune, but I just knew if I moved my finger from here to here to here, I could play that. And my father had come up to the door, you know, trying to give me encouragement. And I just put it down and go, go away. You know, I had to fight my own way. Yeah. But moving, moving on from that then, um, I remember I asked for something for Christmas when I was 12 or 13 years old. And he goes, I'm going to get you an electric guitar. But let's just say I'm glad that he got it for me, you know. So things things change then, you know. The magazine. You just feel that you want it to be on, on that side of it as well. Is this another expression of you being a fan? Um, it's absolutely an expression of me being a fan. But what it came from, I, I went to university in Belfast. And I wanted to be a music journalist. And I did my dissertation on the effects of rock journalism, and the, that was. In the... By the way, let me interrupt you. You're a great writer. I was just telling Shannon that this morning. I was rereading re a few of your other articles, yeah. and you are a really good writer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I mean, I I wanted to be that journalist. And I went to university, and I got a part-time job in a record shop, and then I got offered a management position when I graduated, and it very quickly. It, look, as you can tell, it's all about music for me. So it was like right, I'm managing record stores, and I started working in that side of it. And I just put the journalist thing. I just I kind of forgot about it. I started joining bands, and I started managing record stores. And I managed record stores all over the UK and Ireland. Uh, moved to England. I managed record shops in London, in the Channel Islands, just off the coast of France. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until that all ended. That all ended with uh, it was HMV I was working for. And that ended because of obviously the effects of the economy and you know record stores collapsing in general. That ended three years ago, and I was, you know, and I hate to say this, but I was glad when it did end because it wasn't the job that I started 15 years prior. It was just sale. I may as well have been selling a supermarket. You know, it was yeah. sales, sales, sales. It meant nothing. So whenever that ended, I found myself picking myself up from the dust and going, what I want to do. And I just started into doing this for the first time ever. Um, two years ago, May, two years ago, I'm only doing it two years. And I started writing for a web scene. And then I got picked up by another one. And I started doing a little bit of networking. Um, so I printed out some cards with my number and things on it. By the way, I was still doing music thing as well. When, when, when I had that, the career's over and I started following my life up with everything that I could. I traveled a lot. I've been to America four times in the last four years and making use of, make, trying to make use of my time. I don't, I don't want to say I'm this massive positive dynamo because it was hard, but I was determined not, I was determined to fill my life with things, you know, making the best of a bad situation. So I ended up writing for a website called gigsandfestivals.com in the UK, which was a, a relatively big deal. But they started running into trouble at the end of last year uh, with their finances, you know, nothing to do with me. And I realized that I was I was maybe doing 90% of the work for them. I was doing 90% of the articles. I was writing them. They didn't need to be edit, edited. I had made all the connections myself. I had the people in PR, and I thought, you know, maybe I should take the leap and try and do this myself um, and at the beginning of this year then I started putting that Eon music together purely because well gigs and festivals was going and I thought I want to continue this on um, and it was personally it's a big step because you don't know you know if the PR company is going to be behind you they go how many hits have you had and you're like well I've had no hits the site hasn't went up yet you know who wants to be giving you content or interviews with people for a site that isn't getting any hits whatsoever? So, um, but you know, I mean, you have to start somewhere, and I started in March, and you know, with, with and I have to say, with the support of of people, you know, having having that little bit of faith in you, you know, Nuclear Blast Records have been fantastic, for example, um, Cosa Nostra PR, Duff Press here in the UK as well. Who are giving you those, you know, allowing you into shows to review them and whatnot, that has made Eon Music really possible for me, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Well, when I saw you at the Prague, you know, I knew you were going to uh, 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 be there, or well, actually after, 
there was a part of me that went, yeah, you get in there, man. <laughs> you know, and I thought that was so cool because there is always that part for me, too, where I'm if I'm backstage someplace and there's a part of me that 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 and I'm not good at patting myself on the back. But was yeah. there a part of you when you were back there going, yeah, I belong here. I mean, you were there. You know what? You, you know what? I have to say that probably at the Prog Awards was the first time I felt like that. I've been to the Classic Rock Awards and you're like, whoa, you know, you know, you're surrounded by like the, I was at the Classic Rock Awards in November and I was chatting to uh, this is in half an hour. Jimmy Page, Lemmy, Alice Cooper, Bruce Dickinson, Nolly Holder from Slade, Joe Satriani. And you're still, you know, as I say, I'm only doing it two years. You're getting to know the ropes, you're getting to know the people, the press people, the other journalists. But now I know a lot of people in that kind of behind. I know a lot of PR people. Um, before the Prog Awards, there was actually five, five journalists at the Prog Awards, and four of us know each other who had met up beforehand and had a couple of drinks. Very sociable. It's not, you know, dog eat dog. It's all very, you know, it's great. And yeah, at the Prog Awards, you know, a lot of people. Oh, yeah, man, good to see you again. How have you been? You know, and yeah, I did feel like I belong there, but also I, I know I've got the knowledge, you know, you you stand and interview Trevor Horn. There I have been standing on red carpets and people I heard someone asking uh Jimmy Page at once if if there were any new hip hop bands coming up that he would recommend. Yeah, exactly. Oh my god. You know, I, Yes, you, you get that moment, and you don't know what the hell you're talking about. That well, that person. Yes, exactly. So, like when I was interviewing Trevor Horn, I was going, "Oh my God, you got Buggles. You've got the fact that John Anderson's standing here, Trevor Rebin's standing here. You've got the 90125 album. You've got Frankie Goes to Hollywood. You've got Simple Minds. Simple Minds uh, recorded that song Belfast Child, which I was I was 11 years old, and that was the whole troubles raging. I obviously asked him about that, and that'll be in the interview when it's produced mm -hmm. but that comes from just years of knowledge and think yourself well actually yeah I suppose I I do deserve to be here those you know you're you're just firing those questions off you're not asking oh have you been watching American Idol you know this so tell me about the Steve Vai thing Steve Vai thing was that's not you see I can pinpoint the first time I ever saw Steve Vai as well I think I was 13 and I was sitting watching the television show the video for the audience is listening come on and I was like, whoa, you know, I got Passion and Warfare as soon as I could, again, staring at record sleeves, I can't afford this. Um, he was doing a, he was doing a guitar clinic in Derry, city of Derry, and I decided to go purely because I was up, up in the north visiting my mom, and I was like, I'm going to go over to that guitar clinic. I brought Passion and Warfare with me, I thought, I want to get that signed. That was the only... Other than going to the clinic, that was the only thought in my head. And there was two guys I met at the front of the queue. They're like, oh, Vi always picks out four or five people to play with them. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I had no intention whatsoever of playing with Steve Vi. Anyway, um, so we get into the clinic, and it's all happening. And I was sitting watching it, and I started to feel unwell. I was feeling dizzy and kind of sweaty. and So I went out. I got myself a sugary drink, you know, a low blood sugar thing. I came back in, and I sat down in the front row because I didn't want to disturb anyone. And it was around that time that Vibe was going, right, we're going to do the jam thing. And he goes, we'll have you and you and you. And as he was turning towards me, and I was still feeling really unwell, I was sitting there feeling like crap. I literally just went, what the hell? And as he turns, I guess I just went, <laughs> and he goes, you. <laughs> there was zero forethought. And 30 seconds later, I was standing on the stage with his guitar. Um, but isn't that better? Isn't that better on some levels, the fact that you didn't have to worry about it? It was just like that. It, it is and it isn't. Two things happen. Number one, I because of the position I was sitting in, I went to go up and I stood back to let the first three guys go past. Now, who wants to be the first guy to play opposite Steve Vai? No one. So they didn't pass me. So I ended up going up first. I was the first out of the five. <laughs> so he gave me the guitar. I put it on. It was 
looking at the video now, it's too high for me. I don't like the sound I've got. You know, I would like some delay and stuff on it. And I certainly don't think it was the best performance of my life uh, in terms of how I play. However, I got a lot of feedback from people saying, well, you actually played with Vi. If you look at the video, if you look at the photos, I'm standing opposite him, making eye contact, yeah. trying to feel what he's doing. The best part of the video for me is at the end, whenever he bends a note, I bend one a bit higher, then he goes up. I'm, we were working together. Um, I was told subsequently that the other guys, you know, just come on, stared at their feet, played their little bit, let him play. You know, I for me, the best thing about it was I played with Steve Vai. Not against him. It wasn't the. It, it was far from my best performance, and that's that's my only kind of. If I could change anything, I would change how I was playing, change my sounds. But I got to play with him. When you released your first video on YouTube, when yeah. you sent it out there, you finished it, and you it was like it's in the ether. It's out there. Uh, yeah. uh, what was the, What was the initial feeling for you when you did that? Um, I suppose. Uh, I don't know. It's. I can more take it into the present day and look back on certain videos and go, well, you've progressed from then. Yeah. You know, your technique's better. That solo's wrong. I mean, I interviewed a guy called Oliver Drake, who's who was in a, a band called Evil over here in the UK, a thrash band. And he transcribed uh, Annihilator's catalog, funny enough. He transcribed them in a, in a book, you know, for Jeff Waters. It was published and everything. And he said to me, you can never get it 100% right. He goes, only Jeff Waters, for example, can get Annihilator 100% right because he played it. And he goes, I have these books published, and I listen back now and I go, oh, you got that slightly wrong. And that's how I feel when I watch my videos sometimes. I go, oh, that's, that, that's it's 99%, but it's not 100%. I'm a real perfectionist. So in terms of putting the video out there, um, I'm much happier with what I can do now with the, the way I can produce it and stuff using software. Um, but it's like everything else, you put it out and it, you're open to the criticism and the, you know, and the praise as well.